Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it was a good trip. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 25. We have spent the last couple weeks looking at uh, two parables, Matthew chapter 25 and Luke chapter 19. Um, in Matthew 25, it's the parable of the talents. In Luke 19, it's the parable of the minas. Um, I'm going to read this again for those of you that haven't been here. And we'll kind of summarize and then we'll, we're going to wrap up this part of money matters. Um, I just want to remind you why we're doing this. There's a, there's a couple reasons that we're talking about money. <coughs> One, because God talks about money. Because God thought it was important enough to put it in His Word, it's important enough for us to talk about it. Um, Jesus spent more time talking about money things than He did about that and help them buy Okay, so if it's that important, it's something we need to sit up and take note and, and kind of get an understanding what he's telling us. Okay, now unfortunately in the church, most of the time you hear people talk about money, what are they talking about? Uh, giving. giving, tithes, offerings, give, 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 give. Now, not that that's a bad thing, but that's just a small portion of what God has to say about money. Okay, so we started this series off talking about whose is it? It's God's. It's all His. God says uh, the earth is His and everything in it. That includes us and all of our stuff. He's given it all to us. Uh, in Corinthians, He says, why do you act as though you didn't receive it? What did you do to get it? It's all come from God. Okay? So we, we understand, operating from this principle, this foundation, it's His to begin with. Okay, We don't operate with the assumption that, you know, we keep 90% of ours and give God 10% of ours. We operate with the understanding that it's 100% His. Okay? And He's gifted it to us, but not without purpose. Okay? So we talked about whose it is. We talked about how you get it. We, we did talk about giving, tithes and offerings. That's something we can't avoid because God didn't avoid it. Okay? Um, God loves a cheerful giver. And quite honestly, if your hand is clenched so tightly on what He's given you, you can't open it to receive anything else that He has for you. He loves a cheerful giver. He loves someone that doesn't begrudge rendering back to Him. And I believe that He asked for it back simply to let us know where our heart lies. Okay? Do we love God more or do we love His stuff more? Are we more interested in the key lime pie on the table or the master at the head of the table? Which is more important to us? And uh, Dennis and I were talking the other day and he made a really good point about money being a bondage. It's something that ties you up. And we're going to address that a little bit today. We're going to address it more when we wrap up the entire series. Um, so we talked about how you get it, that you have to work with integrity, and with honesty, because you are representing God in your work, that, that you need to be diligent about working. Um, and, and then we talked a little bit about the parables here that we've been addressing the last couple weeks. Now, in the parable of the minas in Luke chapter 19, we see that there are ten servants, and we see that there are citizens, and, and there's a little bit different angle on the story in Luke 19, because Jesus is talking to a different audience. Okay? Now, in Matthew 25, we know He's come to the temple. As a matter of fact, just before this, the disciples are walking around the temple and they're going, Ooh, ah, look at this great edifice that has been built for our God. Look at the stones. Look at the statuary. Well, there wouldn't have been statuary, would there? Look at the columns. Look at the stuff. And, and Jesus says, you know, hey, tear it all down. I'll rebuild it in three days. Okay? Because he wasn't talking about 
that temple, was he? Okay. So when Jesus is telling this parable, I believe that sitting predominant in the group of disciples that he's talking about is a group of religious leaders. And a good portion of what he's saying here is directed at those religious leaders. Jesus had some of his harshest words for the relig religious leaders of his day because they had received the promise, they had the prophecies, everything that God had done to preface this moment of the Messiah coming into the world was done unto them and they were blind. Jesus calls them blind guides. He also calls them whitewashed tombs and a bunch of vipers. And so when he's telling this parable, I believe that at least 50% of this is directed right at that group of people. Okay? So let's read the, the parable, and then we'll get in and we'll kind of wrap this section up. Uh, so starting in verse 14, Jesus is speaking. He says, for it. Well, what is the it? We back up to verse 1. We see it is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So when he says, for it, don't just assume you know what it means. Look and see. Okay? So he's carrying on the same thought. He says, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also, he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Now this is, if you've uh, been in the church for any length of time, this is a parable that uh, is often spoken of. We, we talk about in Sunday school, you know, five talents, two talents, one talent, and most of the kids in Sunday school can relate to you at least the gist of what's going on here. Now, we talked a couple weeks ago when we started this, this uh, message, and we said that Jesus is a demanding master. Okay? In, in this version, it says that uh, you are a hard man. In Luke, it says you are a harsh or a severe man. And the, the word literally translated, it, it means without compromise. It means that Jesus says, this is where it is, and He doesn't budge. 
He doesn't move. Okay? He expects you to understand that that's what is supposed to happen. Okay? So it's not like he's mean. It's not like he's making ridiculous demands that you didn't know. It means he has told you what he expects, and he expects you to do what he said. Okay? So, we know he is a demanding master. We know that he expects, and I think reasonably so, he expects a return. He expects that the things that he's given to us, we will give back to him with increase. It's, it's not even so much that he's, he's not worried about a deficiency. He doesn't want back just what he gave you. He wants back more. Okay? And we talked about what those talents represent. And, and it represents everything that God gave you. And so often when I hear this message preached, I hear about all the things that He's given you. You know, the, the unique giftings, the particular talents and abilities. But very rarely do I hear about the stuff, the money, and all that that covers. Because we, we, we don't like to talk about those things, you know. Hey, my money business is not your business. Keep your nose out. Well, unfortunately, God doesn't see it that way. God sees it as all his business. And he has a vested interest in you, and he expects a good return off of all that he's given you. Okay? So, we've talked about he's a demanding boss. We've talked about he expects a return. Now, this is the last point that I want to make off of this, these two parables, is that if you are not bringing a return back, this is what Jesus has to say about you. You wicked and slothful servant. You evil and lazy person. Evil and lazy. Now, I believe when Jesus was presenting this message, he was looking right in the eyes of the religious leaders of the day. And I think if he were giving that message to us here today, he would be looking right at us. Okay? I believe that what he spoke then is every bit as valid as it is today. It needs to be, lest it lose its power. So, what does he mean by wicked and slothful? Well, wicked is evil in their behavior. What he did was evil. Slothful is evil in his effort. He didn't even try, did he? No, he went and he took what was the master's, knowing that the intention was that he would put that to use. That he would do something with it so that even when his master came back, even if it was a little, his master would have increase. But his evil action was, oh, I'm all worried about myself. I know, I'm going to go stick it in a hole. That's a safe place for it. But then, his effort was also evil. Because he didn't even try. Oh, what if I blow it? Oh, no, what if I make a mistake? Why did he not try? What did he say? Both passages, he said the same thing. <coughs> he was afraid because his master was a hard man. He had fear. So many people are immobilized in their Christian walk because of fear. Because of fear. But God has not given to us a spirit of fear, has he? No, what has he given to us? A spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Not fear. You say, well, but, but Scripture says that to fear God is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, it's the beginning of the relationship because you have to understand the relative positions between an almighty God and you. Okay? If you don't understand that position, you won't understand, you won't properly appreciate the grace 
that He pours out on us. You, you don't really grasp that. You don't realize that you had nothing to offer Him. And He picked you up out of the slum and cleaned you up and dressed you and anointed you and made you something beautiful and worthy. Okay? Amen. So, when we have fear at the beginning, we should have fear. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Hebrews it says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Look, you don't want Him as your enemy. That's just fear. That is right fear. That is fearing the correct things. But, 1 John tells us that God is love. Not only is He love, He is perfect love. And that perfect love casts out fear. See, as you come to know God and you come to know His grace and you begin to understand the all-consuming love that He has for you, love so great that He was willing before He created us, before He created anything, before that was done, He had already determined, I know what's going to happen. They're going to choose wrong. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to stumble. And not just a little bit. They're going to stumble a lot. And it is going to cost me my son. And the Godhead convened and they came up with a plan. A perfect, spotless sacrifice is going to be needed. Blood that is absolutely pure. And so before creation was done, that, that lamb was slain. Okay? So that's the kind of love that God has for us. Okay? And not just us. It was His love for all of humanity that drove Him to that. You know those Muslims that are massacring people over in the Middle East and in Africa and in Indonesia? He loved them enough for this self-same plan. He loves them enough that He has given grace for a time that they might be saved. That's His all-consuming love. Okay? So, if He did not give to us a spirit of fear, and His perfect love drives out fear, should we ever be this last servant? No. But oftentimes we are, aren't we? We hesitate. We, oh, I, I, I don't think I can go witness to this person because I'm not very good with words and I don't know a lot of Bible and, and uh, you know, I, I'm not really gifted with evangelism. Do you have a testimony? Because yeah. see, the testimony is you were worthless and He made you worthy. You were ugly and He made you beautiful. You were caught in a trap that you could not get out of. A, a trap of your own devising. Of your own building. And He came and delivered you and set you free. That is your testimony. And that no one can take away from you. They might argue with you. They might not believe you. But it is yours and yours alone. Okay, That is what He is asking you to share. That's what he is asking you to bring out into the world. Look, I know right where you're at because I was there. I was there. But God reached down and he took me and he gave me hope where I had none. He instilled in me a love that was beyond the pale of what humanity has. It was not based on what you did for me, but it was based on who he is. I look at this and I, I look at the master and when he answers the servant I look at him and I, I see that he's kind of saying look you should have at least tried you should have at least attempted I mean he's even going so far as to say work with Bank America or whatever bank you have Bank Israel That's how far he's going. Do what is necessary to bring a return. 
He's not, you notice he doesn't even say if they had tried and failed. He doesn't get on to him for failing. He gets on to him for not trying. Not making the attempt. It's the fear of losing that keeps what you have so firmly gripped in your hand. Well, God, if I open my hand, it might go away and never come back. Yeah, maybe God wants to take that out that he can put something else in. Maybe God wants to, maybe, you know what? Maybe God wants to take out from you your dependence on money. Take that away and put in a faith that absolutely trusts God to meet all of your needs. What would it be like to be like the Apostle Paul to say, hey, whether I have little or whether I have much, doesn't matter. Praise God anyway. Well, what would it be like to not be concerned if I had as much as the next door neighbor? Or, or no, I'm not going to use a TV illustration anymore. I have found out since that illustration that several people have recently purchased big TV. So, God bless you. I hope you like watching the pygmies play football on your screen. But what if God is asking you to lay those things down that He can make of you a mighty warrior on His behalf? That when that day comes and He judges us based on what we've done, He looks at you and says, Yeah, but see, it's, it's something that is more easily accomplished than just hope. Because we do what He's given us to do. We trust what He's asked us for. So, Corey Ten Boom, I love this, this quote. Okay? Corey Ten Boom says, said, Hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise it hurts when God pries open your hands. Now, we've been talking about all kinds of different areas in, in the talents and the minors. But I want to bring this down. I'm going to bring our focus right back to money. Okay? Because, see, the devil has so insinuated itself into the economy of the United States of America that the Christians are caught in the same trap as the unbelievers. And we don't even realize it. Because, see, the enemy has woven his way into our financial system that... We believe it's A-OK. -okay. Uh, uh, this is a, a quote by Dave Ramsey. Um, he says, uh, We buy stuff that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't like. <laughs> See, we talked at the beginning about debt in the United States. And that, on average in the United States, each household has approximately $7,000 of debt, consumer debt, in America. But, but that number changes dramatically if you take out those that have no consumer debt. If we just talk about the people that have credit card debt, personal loan, things like that, that number jumps up to over $15,000, just slightly under $16,000 Per family. Okay? Now, let's look at this for a little bit. Um, I did some number crunching and I did some research. And if you have a credit card and you put $1,000 on that credit card, a minimum monthly payment should be depending on your interest rate and your bank and how much they like you, how well you've paid off stuff before, your minimum uh, monthly payment is going to be $25 a month. Okay? And if you make that minimum payment and you have no missed payments, no late payments, they don't have to penalize you for anything, you will pay off that debt, $1,000, nine and a half years. <laughs> And the banks have you absolutely convinced this is the, the way to do it. See that the banks have you consent to have you convinced that you need a good credit score so you can borrow more money from them so they can charge you more. So who ends up making money? 
They do, not you. This is why banks invest billions of dollars every year in advertising. Okay? Now, if we take that same number and we break it down and we do like most Americans do and there are missed payments or there are late payments and fees are applied, now the numbers change significantly. Over 10 years, you will pay almost $5,000. 15 years, you will have $13,500. 20 years, you will pay $35,000. We say, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to pay it off. It's not going to go 20 years. But if you pay it off and they put more money back on it, guess what? You're still writing the $1,000. The bank wants you, it was interesting because when I was doing this, I went out and I was looking for an interest calculator. <coughs> Very interesting that all the interest calculators that are found by financial institutions always painted in a best case scenario. Because they don't want you to see the reality of what's going on out there. They don't want you to realize that they are stewing you into a pot that is going to take you forever to get out of. Okay? The, the problem here is, is that most Americans that have consumer debt don't owe a thousand dollars. They owe almost sixteen thousand dollars. This is a problem, folks, because you have suddenly become slave to the lender. And the lender doesn't care about you. They care about money. And all you are is a conveyance for them to get more money. I am a hard and fast believer in owe no man anything save the debt of love. And I tell you what, I'm going to share uh, mine and Christie's testimony because years ago <clears throat> we got married we had uh, a number of health issues the first few years we were married uh, we had three kids in the space of uh, just under six years uh, we had a couple of surgeries in there um, and we had a lot of debt and we're college students and when you're a college student you, you don't get really high paying jobs and when you graduate from college with a uh, degree in pastoral ministries, you don't get a lot of opportunities to make what your education equips you for. And so we were, we were getting those nasty calls every night. If you ever get a call from Mr. Keene, tell him the band notes say hello and farewell. <laughs> he was evil. I mean, he would curse at us. He would say awful things about us. And every night when that phone rang, we would, we would flinch, cringe. And we were absolutely convinced, uh, convicted that there were certain things that we were doing wrong that needed to be done right. First, we had to quit with the credit cards. Because it was so easy to go, well, you know, we don't have the cash to get it now. Let's put it on credit. Instead of going, how about we just don't have that now? Okay? And then... Big issue. God really got onto us about tithing and told us to be faithful. Because see, the way we did our budget, and we did do budgets back then, and it, you know we would go down, and and God was always at the bottom. And when the money ran out, God was the one that didn't gripe at us and didn't give us cranky calls at dinner time about where's my money. And so God was the one that kept getting shorted. Well, He understands. He loves us anyway. But then we, we started looking into Scripture and we saw the principle that if you honor God first, He opens the floodgates of heaven to help you. And so we started honoring God and not using the credit card and start paying things down and, and incredible things started happening. Now, our income did not change in any significant way. I was still doing grunt labor. But the bills started diminishing. And, and we started getting these weird calls where we would call for a balance and say, hey, you know, we're trying to figure out how much is left on this, trying to figure out how we can get this thing paid down. Oh, that debt's gone. That's been paid. Well, we, we didn't pay it. Yeah, we know. It, it's been taken care of. It's been paid. 
And over the course of about a year and a half, we were able to work ourselves completely out of debt. Now this is back about 1997. 1998, we're in Houston, and I've got a good job. And all of a sudden, the money's there. And, and I, was, I had bought into the lie that I needed a good credit score to impress the banks. And so we got a credit card. And the credit card was just to eat out a couple times a month, and we pay it off at the end of the month. And then guess what happened? Something broke. And I didn't have the cash. So we put that on the credit card, assuming that when we got the cash, we would pay it off. But then we couldn't pay off our dinner anymore, and we had some other stuff on there. And, and guess what? It started increasing again. We fell into the same trap that we had fallen into before. Now, part of our testimony, God blessed us with a, a business that made a large amount of money. You know, there were months where we would bring $12,000 in in a month. And that $12,000 went right back out. And yeah, we had a business, we, we paid our employees, we paid, paid for the machinery, we paid for the phone lines and all of that. But the money that came into our family, we would always set our budget to the upper end of that. And then on a month where we didn't make that much, we were, uh-oh. Now what do we do? Well, we got to take it from here, we got to borrow it from there. And we found ourselves, uh, what year was that, that we finally threw it in? 2011? What, quit the business? Yeah, 2011. 2011. We we 2009. We determined we've got to we've got to we've got to kill this horse. It's running away with us. We've got to get off. And so we started getting rid of a lot of debt. We didn't, you know. Hey, satellite TV is great for filling your mind with garbage. Uh, you get 300 and 400 channels on that thing, and there's not a single thing worthy of watching on. So what do you do? You watch unworthy things. Hey man, I'm paying for this. I need to watch something. <laughs> I'm getting ripped off. We got rid of satellite. We got rid of as many debts as we could, but because of the way we had so constructed things, it has taken us a long time to get to the point where we live under what we make. We're still not there yet. You know why? Because we are working our tails off to pay off everything that we incur. And, and, and i got to tell you, folks, this is from Glenn. This is not necessarily from God. But I am absolutely convinced that bankruptcy is an egregious offense for a Christian to commit. I believe that, you know, hey, things are rough, things are tight, people are calling you. There are other options. I believe with all my heart that you get your living underneath your, your income, get your expenses underneath your income, you trust God, you repent of what got you to this place. And repent doesn't just mean, God, I'm sorry, fix it so I can keep spending. <laughs> Repenting means, God, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this anymore. I want to do it your way. Not my way, your way. That's repenting. Okay? God will do the miraculous to cover you. Malachi 3, that's the only place in all of Scripture that God says, test me. Put me to the test. And see if I won't respond. Okay? God first, everyone else later. Okay? So. <clears throat> what is this all about? It's all about money. <coughs> You know, um, we read the, the verse in Proverbs says that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. You guys, anybody here have an idea what is the verse that comes right before that? Anybody? See, see what, what, let me flip over here real quick. Because I'm going to read it to you in context. Because this is something that jumped out at me the other night when we were... Uh, watching Dave Ramsey. By the way, we are doing the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. Uh, we have already done it uh, before. We've also gone through his total money makeover and, and we're doing it again because we need to be disciplined to do these principles. Um, so, uh, the verse, first verse, chapter, or chapter 22, verse 6. This is what 
Solomon, who is making generalized observations. These are not promises, these are observations. This is what I see is normally happening in these situations, okay? So verse six, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now guess what comes next? The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. See, I, I, I was taken when um, this was on the Dave Ramsey video because I believe I'm convinced now that, hey, Solomon was talking about how we're training our kids because more is caught than taught. And the way we live our lives, our kids are picking up. And if they see mom and dad going, well, you know, um, we can't afford this right now, but Bank America can. So we're going to let Bank America buy it for us. <coughs> then what are our kids learning? They're learning to put themselves in the same enslavement that we're in. When, when we realized what had happened and how we'd fallen into the same trap the second time, and, and uh, I, I got to tell you, there were warnings, there were promptings that we should have been paying attention to, and we'd go, oh yeah, well, and then we'd kind of poo-poo them to the side and, and, and continue on. When God really got a hold of us, we had to sit down with our kids and we had to repent and say, look, we've done it wrong. Don't do as we did. You guys have to be better at this than we are. We're, we're making changes. We've got to turn some things around. But, but this was our sin, and, and we don't want it to be a generational sin because my parents lived on credit cards, Christy's parents lived on credit cards, and, and we didn't want to pass to our children a legacy of paying three times what something was worth because you had to have it now. <clears throat> James McDonald says that consumer debt is the drunk driving of personal finance. I mean, the banks are spending millions of dollars, billions of dollars to convince you, I've got to get it now. I deserve this. It's not very often that I watch TV um, that, that uh, I get to just see commercials. Um, and, and I was amazed. I was shocked. Uh, we were, I don't even remember. We were sitting somewhere and the TV was on and I was, I was just kind of watching the commercials and I was amazed how many times this, this idea of I deserve popped up. You deserve a break today. Eat fat at McDonald's. You deserve an Audi. You can't afford a Ford. You don't deserve an Audi. This, this whole idea, the enemy is so slick at ensnaring us in his traps and obligating us to the bondage of finance. It steals our joy. It adds to our anxiety. It increases difficulties in the relationships in our lives, specifically husbands and wives. It leads us to live a life of fear. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Most Americans today, if they lost their job, they could not last three months without getting another job to replace it. They couldn't last three months. And yet we have the highest standard of living. We're in the top three nations in the world with the highest standard of living. And yet we can't go three months without a job. We're working ourselves to death for junk. We no longer aspire to anything great because Bank America can give it to us right now. We don't push ourselves to build, to increase, to save. How are we treating the things, the stuff God has given us? When I was a, a, a kid, my parents always said they would never buy us a car because you never appreciated what was bought for you in the same way that you appreciated it when you bought it. I, I'm absolutely convinced that's the case. We helped our kids to buy their cars, but they had to earn the money. They had to 
get a sufficient amount of money to get their first car and then we would help them if they needed repairs or tires or things like that to make that car function in a safe manner. But they, man, they bought the car on their own. They had to do that. And then if they chose to trash their car and have empty sodas, soda cans and drinks and McDonald's wrappers and stuff in their car, your car, your problem. It's not my car, it's not my problem. You know? Uh, we had one son who um, ignored the engine light, check engine light. And I kept telling him, you need to get that looked at. It might not be a big deal, but it might be a big deal. And at that point, he was commuting from Corvallis to Missoula to go to the university. And one day, we get a call. Dad, car broke down. I'm stuck halfway between Missoula and Lolo. So, wow, that's a long walk. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what should I do? Well, I would suggest you call a tow truck. Mom and I come up and get you. And he had to pay $2,000 to repair an engine on his $2,000 car. <laughs> and, and he learned a critical life lesson because he, he was saving that money so he could get married. And his wedding had to take place an entire year later than what he was planning. Now, I, I trust that God knew what he was doing. I don't think they were ready to be married at that time. But a year later, I still was questioning whether they were ready to be married. But, you know, they were the same age I was, so you know, they're probably stupid like me. Now we're ready. Heck, we can do it all. We love each other. Right? So, you know, that's one of those life lessons. Are you doing the best with the things that God has given you? Have you taken the blessings, the income, those things? You see, one of the things that we, we forget is we so often think of our job as our source. The job is what provides that, that, that our provision. But God says over and over in His Word that He is our provider. As a matter of fact, He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. The job may be the means that he is using in this moment to keep that provision. But you know, the, the, the scripture says, I have never seen a righteous man's children driving Fords or going to community college. No, that's not what it says. What does it say? The necessities of life, those basic necessities, are never lacking in a righteous man's life. They're not lacking. But we, we, we want to push that margin up, don't we? We want to increase it. We want to float it. We want it to get bigger. See, the, the thing I want you to contemplate today, we know that Jesus is a demanding boss. He is without compromise. We know that he has given us explicit instructions on the things we are to be about and how we're to be about them. We know that he is expecting a return on all that he has gifted us with. And we know that if we stand before him and all we have to give back to him is what he's given us, that he is going to consider us <coughs> slothful, wicked. So my, my challenge to you, look at what God has given you. All of those things. The giftings, the talents, the abilities, the call. the money, the stuff. Are you making an increase so that when he comes, remember when, when the master came back, he called them to account. I want to know what you did while I was gone. When that accounting comes, will you have to lay down at his feet an increase? Father, we bless you today. Because you are an awesome, mighty God. I thank you, Father, that your grace exceeds the limit of our sin. I thank you, Father, that you are merciful. That you give us what we don't deserve. Father, I thank you for your word. That you have given us direction. You've given us purpose. You've given us clear 
requisites as to what you desire of us. I ask, Father, that you would lead us clearly today. Father, that our hearts and our minds would be in tune with yours, that our steps would follow in the path that you've set before us. We bless you and we thank you for all your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.